the air above the world has no boundaries. By day and by night, the planes of the Air Transport Command circle the continents and the oceans, landing at the equator, within the Arctic Circle, on lonely specks of coral wind or bad weather. And here are some of the crew. The flight engineer, whose job is simply these four engines. And the radio operator, whose job is to keep in constant communication with land bases by radio. And the flight traffic clerk, who represents the first pilot for the observance of all safety regulations and cabin discipline. And here is the pilot himself, the commander of the plane, aloft or afloat, regardless of your comparative military rank. Beside him is his co-pilot and his navigator. All of them men with many, many months of training and experience. Men whose everyday job it is to move this plane across the empty spaces of the world. That space includes a lot of ocean. Very, very infrequently has it been necessary to come down on the surface of that ocean. But for this one chance, every ATC crew has been thoroughly trained. To do this job safely and well, they need the help of one more man. And that man is you, the passenger. Your job and the job of your fellow passengers is to learn a few simple and basic rules for saving your own life if you have to ditch. Ditching just means landing a land plane on the surface of the ocean. It's called ditching because Allied pilots often had to land in the channel between England and Europe, and that channel was known as the Big Ditch, hence ditching. A forced landing on water is not likely to happen to your plane. The chances are against it and so is the remarkable safety record of the Air Transport Command. Your safety and comfort is the particular job of one man, and that man is the flight traffic clerk. For instance, he's an expert on what to wear in a plane. Women should wear slacks. Men, anything that's comfortable. Your most important piece of apparel is furnished to you by the ATC and designed to keep you afloat. Uh, by the way, if you can't swim, tell the flight traffic clerk about This is your life vest, otherwise called a May West. A crew member will notify you when to wear it. Here it is at all times. Be sure you put it on frontwards. That's simple enough. The straps are on the side next to the body. This applies to the waist strap, too. The mouthpieces are on the right and the protection patch away from your body. The crotch strap has a loop through which the waist strap must go. And the same for the loop of the back strap. With the waist strap through both loops, you hook it on the right hand side. These straps are purposely loose to allow for the expansion of the life vest. It's inflated by the carbon dioxide gas in these cartridges, one on each side. The trip cords are hooked around to prevent accidental release, are lifted off only when the vest is to be inflated. Otherwise, they're kept hooked safely over the tops of the cartridges. If the CO2 supply is exhausted or won't work, you can inflate the vest by using the mouthpieces. Ordinarily, they're kept closed by turning these small valves in a clockwise direction. To double check, try to blow into the tubes. If you can't blow, they're safely closed. Open them only when the gas cartridges don't work. All this applies just as well to the old style May West. The same cartridges, the same release cord. But notice, no strap down the back. Here's how any type of life vest will inflate. Unhook the release cords on both sides and pull down sharply. This vest is improperly fitted. The straps are too loose. On the other hand, this vest is strapped on much too tightly. It feels nice and snug now, but uh, let's see what happens when the vest is inflated. For the average person, the waist strap should have about four inches of slack. The crotch strap, about eight inches. Test it yourself. One more thing, this packet of C-marker dye. To release, pull this tab down, but only if you're in the water and you think you hear a plane coming. Yes, 
The flight traffic clerk knows all about these May Wests now. But there was a time six months ago and a hundred thousand miles back when he was resting very comfortably on a bucket type seat until... Very dangerous thing to do using a May West as a cushion. An injured life vest may not support you in the water. The Colonel also wanted to know if he understood how to brace himself for ditching. Luckily, he did. When riding in a bucket seat, tighten your seat belt and grab your ankles. Hold on. Don't relax after the first bounce because there will be a second much harder and maybe a third and a fourth as a plane skips off the surface of the water. But in this type of seat, here's the proper way to brace for ditching. First, you make sure your seat belt is fastened. Then you cross your arms in front of you and support your head against your arms. You keep braced after the first impact when the tail hits and hold that position for the second really bad impact. There may be more, so stay braced till the plane has really stopped or you may get seriously hurt. The flight traffic clerk will also point out the emergency doors, which may be different for different planes. Use the one on the left, the same side as the main door. But you use these emergency doors only if it's absolutely necessary and then only if directed by the crew. Ordinarily, you'll go out the main door with a special handle release for the hinges. You're ready to take off now. Down below you is the expanse of sea which your plane will cross in the next few hours. You can have full confidence in this plane, in its engines, in its crew, in the countless months of thought and experience that go into these few hours of your journey. But for the one chance, bad luck or accident, there's a bell on this wall facing you. It's worthwhile getting a preview of what you would do if that bell were to ring, if the plane had to ditch. signal is several short rings. The flight clerk takes the first action. He puts on his May West and makes sure all the passengers are doing the same thing. Everything is done quickly, surely, and without panic. The flight clerk reviews for you the order in which you leave the plane. Then helps you adjust all seats into the ditching position. Now you're going to prepare for the shock of landing on water. First your seat belts, tight, secure. Now take off your tie, loosen your collar. You take any sharp objects out of your pockets, such as combs or pens. Take your glasses off. You keep all your clothes and your shoes on. You'll need them later for warmth and protection. Don't strike matches or lighters. Independent emergency lights are available if necessary. Now, unhook the release cords on your May West. Of course, you'll not be alone when it's time to ditch. Members of the crew will be there with you tying down all loose articles so they won't be thrown about the plane during the landing, taking out and stowing the emergency doors, packing and tying down the water containers close to the rafts, and unlocking, but not opening, the main cabin door with the handle turned down. The minutes between the first warning bell and the second are used to take every precaution, check every detail. The SOS is already going out to all ships, planes, and shore stations within range. Planes moving down.
bombs. Prepare for ditching. You're ready, braced, head against both arms. That was the tail. Now for the nose. Stay braced. The plane has stopped. The next 30 seconds are very precious. The door with hinges released can be pushed out. The ditching rope goes out too. You use it to get out of the plane. Now for the rafts. Made of rubber fabric and inflated by a large cylinder of carbon dioxide, they work on the same principle as your May West. All they need is a good hard pull on the lanyard to release the gas. But don't inflate your May West yet. In the doorway, blow into the mouthpieces to make sure they're closed. Then pull both cords. Don't jump. Lower yourself gently into the raft. The first thing into the first raft is the emergency radio kit. This kit will be your link to the whole network of the Air Transport Command. Inflate your life vest only as you leave the plane, not inside the plane, or you might never be able to get out. And take a thermos jug with you as you go. If your raft doesn't inflate, board another one and keep as dry as possible. If you have to go into the water, slide in. Your May West will support you and a lot more for days if necessary. To open that uninflated raft, rip open the cover, find the cord, and get a good grip. Brace with your other hand and then pull. Sometimes the raft may be upside down. Here's how to ride it while you're in the water. First, get hold of the rope and throw it across the width of the raft. Then swim around to the other side. Remember, you may have to do this job by yourself. Other passengers may not know how to help you. Grasp the rope and pull yourself up. With your wet clothes, it'll take a certain amount of effort. Climb far enough up so you can get a hold of the loop on the other side. Now, by placing your knees against the gas chamber, you can pull the raft over. You get in by grasping the uninflated seat, first one hand, then the other. Always climb in at the side of the raft. Now to give this helpless passenger a hand. His back towards you, under his armpits. Brace your knees against the buoyancy chamber. Use the water as a springboard. That's it. These rafts are your home now. Bring them together so you can even up the number of passengers. In order to have the guidance of the train crew members and to keep together as a larger unit and be more visible from the sky, you tie the rafts together, about a raft's length apart. Now the first thing you do is treat the injured with supplies from your first aid kit. And look around you, check for missing men. They may be near you unconscious and floating low in the water. Meanwhile, you lash every loose article to the raft itself. One of the side pockets will provide you with cord. That's to make sure that none of your precious supplies are tossed into the sea. Now's the time to inflate the cross seats, which do not open automatically. In the life raft kit at the bottom of the raft, you'll find a hand pump along with other emergency equipment. It's easy to put together and simple to attach to the valve. The seats inflated help to strengthen the raft. If you get a puncture and you haven't got a spare raft, reach for the repair kit at once. has everything you need to repair that leak. First, take one of the wooden plugs and turn it in until it stops any further leakage from the hole. Get the tools out of the repair kit and prepare to fix that puncture just as you would fix a hole in an inner tube. With this piece of sandpaper, you scrape around the area of the puncture. Now, on the clean, dry surface, you spread the rubber cement.
And finally, you put on this patch. If you've got one of the newer rafts, they'll be equipped with this metal repair plug and a complete set of instructions in its use. Now, of course, you'll have to pump more air into the buoyancy chamber using either one of the two connections. In cold weather, too, the raft may get soft and need more air. Or if a hot sun causes the gas to expand, valve some of it off. Meanwhile, an inventory of supplies is being taken. None of this should be used for the first 24 to 48 hours. That applies to the water, too. A human being can easily get along without food or water during that time. He uses what's stored up in his body. Conserve food, conserve water, and conserve your energy. But have a plan. Using your compass, your charts, and your common sense, lay out a course for some objective and stick to it. Attached to your life raft are three oars in sections which can be fitted together. Oars have a lot of uses besides simple navigation. Using the extensions as a mast and boom, you can rig up a sail and use the third oar as a tiller. Now you're ready to go toward help as help comes toward you. Meanwhile, your best bet is still your radio. It's a transmitter, powerful and easy to operate with instructions at the top. Ordinarily, you open this box kite into any kind of breeze and it lifts up your antenna so you can send your message out across the ocean. If there's a dead calm, you inflate a balloon with a cylinder of hydrogen, being careful not to smoke until the balloon goes up. Hanging there in the sky is your lifeline to the rest of the world. Keep cranking the generator, which automatically sends out an SOS. Keep sending, especially during the three-minute international silent periods, at 15 minutes after the hour and 15 minutes before the hour. Allow for error a few minutes either way and send for 10 minutes at least. Somebody somewhere is picking up your SOS. During the day, your best signaling device is this simple mirror. Keep it near you and read the instructions on the back. It's for signaling to a plane which might go by very fast, so practice with it until you're expert, because this little mirror has an absolute range of 10 miles. A plane might see your signal even though you can't see the plane. As the day wears on, it gets very hot at sea level. But the clothes you have on are good protection against sunburn during the day, as well as against the cold wind at night. This is true, and especially true, in tropical regions. So literally and figuratively, keep your shirt on. Of course, it's important not to waste water by sweating. You need that water to stay healthy. On very hot days, you can cut down perspiration by wetting your clothes with seawater. Wet or dry, keep all your clothing on. Just be careful about your shoes. Make sure the nails don't damage the bottom of the raft. Another useful item in each raft is a tarpaulin. To use it as a canopy against the sun, keep the yellow side up. Stay in the shade under it without cutting off the ocean breeze. And keep covered, not only your body, but your arms, your legs, and your head. So the first day will pass. And when night comes, you will take your turns watching, listening while the others sleep, and grinding out your SOS. And if you hear something overhead, you attach your signal lamp, and the generator flashes the SOS toward the sky. Keep your pistols and flares dry, and don't shoot unless you're sure you hear a plane. And don't fire at the plane. Aim at the approach or alongside of the plane. 
But if there's no plane, that flare is just wasted, swallowed up in the darkness of the ocean with no one to see it. It's the morning of the second day. The rafts that appeared so flimsy when you stepped into them have proved entirely seaworthy. They've carried as many as six men for as long as 30 days through calm and rough seas alike. All night long, you've kept sending that automatic SOS twice an hour, and you keep sending it today. It's time now to break your 24-hour fast with food and water. Don't eat unless you have water, because the process of digestion itself uses up water. There's a trick to drinking water, too. Keep it in your mouth for a long time. Rinse it around, gargle, then swallow. But ration all your supplies carefully. You can get along on far less food than you think. To supplement your supplies, you can fish. Your fishing kit will have the equipment you need. Fishing from a life raft is a two-man job. A large fish might cut your hand, break your line, or cut into your raft. So one man holds the line while you troll. Fresh fish. And you don't have to cook it, because most fish can be eaten raw. Fish contains water as well as food. Save some for bait, and what you don't eat, preserve by drying it in the sun. If you've used up your ointment, the oil under the fish's skin is good for sunburn. When sunlight gives way to rain, you put up this special tarpaulin designed to catch rainwater. Use the first water you catch to rinse any salt crystals from the tarp. Then store the rest of the water in rubber bags and in any other container you've got. The best container of all is the human body. Drink all the rainwater you can comfortably hold. If the shower becomes a storm, be sure your sail is down, your sea anchor out, and lash down all loose articles. Your raft will naturally ship a certain amount of water. That's nothing you get excited about, just keep bailing it out. You can ride out even the worst storm if you take these simple precautions. Even while you're sweating out this storm, by day and by night, your rescue is being organized. Remember, you've been flying on a regular route of the ATC. Planes on remote islands, on remote shorelines, are ready to hunt for you. Out of a small number of forced landings, there's been a high percentage of successful rescues. Another morning on the open sea. You've no way of knowing whether your SOS has been heard. You've got to stick it out, wait, and keep up the will to live, which is almost as important as knowing how to live. If you run short of water, anything liquid looks good to drink. It's not. Seawater is especially dangerous. It will give you cramps, fever, make you thirstier than ever. Seawater is poisonous. On some rafts, you'll find a machine complete with instructions for distilling seawater. On others, chemical tablets are included for the same purpose. Keep your radio going twice every hour and remember, no matter how bad things look, rescue is coming. Rescue is here. Now's the time to put out the sea dye, scatter it downwind and paddle fast. The pilot will see the flash of the mirror before he sees you, and he'll see that blotch of sea dye in the water. like these are no longer front page news. Rescue is here, but don't be tempted to gorge yourself on your rations and water. It may be days before the rescue plane can land to pick you up. But you're safe now. You've learned to survive. You've left the safety of this great plane only in imagination. But you know now what to do if this bell should ever ring. You know how to wear this life vest, how to brace for ditching, how to manage a life raft, how to use emergency equipment, equipment which is constantly being changed and improved, and even how to drink water. With a few simple rules, plus a generous portion of common sense, you've learned how to ditch, 
and live.